Today's scripture reading comes from uh, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. And you can find this reading in your pew Bible uh, on page 166. So in the New Testament, on the back, in the back, on page 166. So please follow along with me if you would like. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of cross, or sorry, the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Before we begin the sermon, three quick things. Uh, I don't like that sermon title, throw it out. It's not really important. Sometimes the direction of the sermon changes after I give Alan the sermon title to print the bulletin. So eh, anyway, not important, but I wanted to say that. I also want to say thank you to a number of folks, to Eric and to Mark and to Chris and to the choir, and to Michael. What powerful, it's so powerful to sit here and to listen to how beautiful you sing and the eloquent messages and all the people willing to help out. Thank you so much, all of you that help out with worship and in the life of this church, which really is everyone, but I don't have time to name all of you, so thank you. On that note, I wanna say something. It's a special, it's always a special Sunday, but today Riley is back with us for the first time after, after her injury. I know a lot of y'all like me, you saw Riley here. It's been a, a bit of a recovery from a, a broken ankle and just overwhelmed with joy to see Riley. So what a, what a gift your presence is to us. We're so thankful to have you. So you notice that Janie is not here, she's been sick. And we'd ask that you please keep Janie in your prayers this week. So prayers for the Miller family and so thankful to see you, Riley. Let us bow our heads. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be open and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Back in college, in my United States History 1 course, my professor told a story to the class. He said there was this Puritan settlement that decided to split and to form four different settlements. I'm not sure if it was to spread influence or just to cover the area or whatever, but they split into four settlements, but they agreed to stay connected. They were gonna meet once a year and worship together and support each other. And of course, Puritans were very big on the religious life and so cared deeply about scripture and worship and thought that if we read scripture and if we are right with God, then that means we're going to be, as Paul writes, of the same mind and of the same purpose. We'll interpret scripture the same way. So that year passed, they got back together, and what do you think happened? There were four different interpretations of scripture. We might hope that the reaction would have been, wow, I guess God is bigger than we know, and sometimes God is at work in the context, the different contexts that we're in, and what a joy it is 
to have different interpretations and to wrestle with scripture. That's not what happened. The reaction of each group was to say to the other three, you are a heretic. Not long after that, when I started bartending, a, a friend of mine, a regular, came in, sat down, got him his crown and coke. I still remember the drinks of a lot of my regulars. And we started talking about church. I asked him what church he goes to, and he told me, and he said, what I love about this church I go to is that we just believe what's in the Bible. Whatever's written, that's what we believe. And at that point, I knew a little bit about Scripture and a little bit about the church, and I thought, you know, doesn't everybody believe that? So I'm sorry, it's, I think it's a little arrogant to say that our church has one, the one correct view of Scripture, especially when there's so many divisions and denominations and disagreements that there are people of faith who disagree with each other and sometimes can't stand each other. And yes, in our history of Christianity, sometimes get violence about it. I don't think I need to make the argument this morning that we lived in a divisive world, in a divisive time. We're certainly divided in our politics. We live in a class system where the, at the moment the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And boy, that drains us. Division hurts us. It fills us with anxiety that we're always seem to be fighting or arguing. There are days I just can't stand to open social media. And I bet you feel that way as well. I know you come to your church and this beautiful message about unity in Christ and you think, even by church though, there's divisions in my church. Uh, this last, in December, uh, United Methodist Church went viral on Twitter. And I told someone on a day in which the United States is sending thousands upon thousands of troops to the Middle East, I wish we were going viral because we were proclaiming a message of justice and love and peace. That wasn't the reason. We were going viral because of the proposed separation that will probably happen in May. And so it seems that even our witness on Twitter as God's United Methodist Church is one of division. And it makes us anxious and weary and tired. And yes, it leads to brokenness and wounding. So it may or may not be a comfort to you to read our scripture for today and see that these divisions have been happening in the church as long as the church has been the church. Way back in the first century, the church at Corinth that Paul established, he gets word in his prison cell that there is division in the church. And that some folks are saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. That people are trying to say, we have it right and you have it wrong. That people are seeking stature to be better than others. That people are trying to be self-justifying. And I love Paul's response, because Paul could have easily said something along the lines of, who is it that encountered Christ on the road? Me. My people are the ones who are correct. Paul doesn't say that. Paul takes himself down and he humbles himself. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And Paul, I love this part of scripture. It makes me laugh every single time. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize the household of Stephanus. <laughs> Beyond that, mm, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Is Paul having a senior moment? <laughs> did he not want to cross out what he had just written in his letter, so he just went with it? I don't think so. I think Paul is making an appeal to a fundamental truth that we need to hear. And to understand it, let's talk a little bit about what we believe as Methodists about baptism. No doubt you've heard that a lot of Christians believe in something called believer's baptism. If you haven't heard that phrase, you've probably heard it. That people will only, some denominations and churches, will only baptize you once you are of age to 
profess Christ as your Savior. Uh, and then once you believe, you accept Christ into your heart, you're baptized, and that's the moment that God enters into your life and changes you and transforms you. We don't believe that. If you've been in this church long enough, you'll notice we do infant baptisms. If you were raised Methodist like I was, you might have been baptized like me as an infant. If you're a visitor to this church, we're so glad to have you here. Hopefully you stick around long enough and join the church and see some infants being baptized. And that's because Methodists, we believe that baptism is less about what we are doing, more about what God is doing. Baptism is less about us, more about God. Paul's not trying to de-emphasize baptism. Paul is saying that baptism is not the key to salvation. It's not the good news in itself. Baptism, we believe, is an outward sign of an inward grace. And we Methodists believe in three manifestations of God's grace, provenient, justifying, and sanctifying. We won't go into all of that today, don't worry. But we believe infant baptism is a sign of what's called provenient grace. It's an old understanding of the word prevent. It doesn't mean to stop. It means to come before or to go before. See, Methodists, we believe that God does not come into your life at the moment of baptism or the moment of salvation. God is already present in your life. There's never a time when God was not claiming you, that God didn't know you, that God was not saying, I love you even when you're an infant and can't speak for yourself, even before you've done anything worthwhile. It's not about your stature. This unity isn't about what we build. This unity in Christ, the same mind, the same purpose, is about the simple truth that God loves you. And that's what we claim in baptism. Open up your hymnal, if you can find one in your seat, to page 35. If you're along the live stream and don't have a hymnal right next to you, I understand it's okay. It's our service in order of baptism. I want to read what the congregation responds with. So when people are baptized, the pastor will say to the congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And we respond, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons, the persons being baptized, now before you in your care? And how do we respond to that call to care for each other? We say, with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness, that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them, that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. I love that about our liturgy. With God's help, live according to the example of Christ. We'll surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness grow in their trust of God, be true disciples that walk in the way that leads to life. It's about what God is doing in your life. And that can be a difficult message to hear. And I think it's an especially difficult message for this church to hear. And I say that because of who we are. And I love who we are. In a few minutes, well, after the service, we're going to have this presentation on what I've learned at the listening sessions. And one thing I keep hearing about our church is we care deeply about justice. I love that about us. We care about the state of the world, as does God. We want to be a part of God's transformation of the world, and that is wonderful, and we need to continue that. But there are a couple of dangers when it comes to justice work. Number one... When you work in justice, you get the, the tendency to feel like you have to do everything on your own. That you take on these giant problems of, say, homelessness or hunger or poverty or prison reform. And those things are too big for any one person. And when you don't see results of your hard work, and often because it's such a global thing, your work doesn't have immediate results. It can lead to fatigue and burnout and a sense of failure and people walk away. 
And there's another trap when it comes to justice work. If we have this understanding unintentionally like the people in the church in Corinth do, that what I believe is right and people need to believe like me when we self-justify, it leads to the thought that we have to be everybody's savior. And folks, we're not the savior. I'm not your savior. Christ is the savior. And I see that play out time and time and again in situations of abuse. Whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual or mental abuse. And I'm sorry to say that the church universal for centuries has played into this horrible logic that, oh, it's your cross to bear. If you can show a good example to your abuser, maybe they'll come to Christ. It's nonsense and it's harmful and it's evil. It's not your job to be abused. If you think it's your place to save the world, then logically it follows it's your place to save your abuser. But if you recognize the fundamental truth that God loves all people, that the person doing the most work in your life and your neighbor's life is God, that gives you the freedom to walk away from abuse and say, I believe in prevenient grace, that God is at work in this person's life. And then it's my job to walk away and heal, and God is going to keep working on changing this person. That's a hard message to hear. Oh, it's easy to hear it now, but it's hard to do because we feel guilt and shame that we weren't able to change that person. We weren't able to solve this crisis. It's God's work. We play a part in it. And sometimes our part is to step away and to heal There's another thing about baptism I want to share. I've never liked the language of being saved. I think a lot of you are probably with me on this. I'm saved. Are you saved? It turns into a competition. It sets us at odds with each other. It makes kind of salvation a numbers game. I don't like that. I don't think John Wesley liked it either, the founder of the Methodist faith. He had this to say about salvation, that moment when you accept Christ in your life, which often comes for adults, at least at baptism. Not everyone, but often does. He said about baptism, about justifying grace, that we are restored to original righteousness. We are restored to original righteousness. Think about what that means. That means that we are not created in sin and despair, that we need to be remade by God. It means we are created as righteous and holy, as a being treasured and loved by God. That's who you are, every single one of you. And yes, sin exists and brokenness and wounding exists. And when God, when we perceive God in our lives, It's not God taking some horrible thing created to sin and despair. It's God restoring us to who we fundamentally are. And when we accept that, that we are beloved creations of God, and we see that in our neighbor, I believe that that opens us up to the hope and the unity that this world needs. Back in college, I'm just going to tell some semi-appropriate college stories throughout this sermon. Back in college, I took a class on existential philosophy. And on day one, the professor said to us, I want you to write down one word that sums up who you are. One word that describes you in your entirety. And I couldn't think of a word. I eventually wrote down student. Not a good one. There's times I'm not a student. But I thought that's probably the best answer. And all of us wrote down our word, and the professor one by one took us apart. No, you're more than what you wrote, aren't you? Every single one of us. And his point was this. There is no one word that sums up who you are. You're more magnificent than that, greater than that. You cannot be contained by any label. And I've thought about that for years, and I've come to this conclusion. If I had to write that again, well, I couldn't write a word, but I would think the only thing that I could say is this. I am a child of God. We are children of God. And when we live into that truth, 
not in fancy, hard to explain theology or doctrine, as Paul says, not with eloquent wisdom, that simple fundamental truth. And I believe we witness to the world the unity of mind and purpose that we seek, a unity that the world desperately needs. This week, a friend of mine, a fellow pastor, wrote on Facebook and our clergy page that um, he was going to preach on racism at his church today, and he requested some prayers. And so I wrote back to him, and I, I prayed from this morning and about the same language that I used in my message to him. I thought about it for a while. What do I want to say to him? And I finally wrote this. May you find serenity in the presence of Christ. And that's what I pray this morning. God, would you be with this pastor that he may find serenity in your presence when we have this unity in God's love, this purpose, this mindfulness that we are children of God. It doesn't end the discord or disharmony of the world, but it means that we can navigate systems of chaos and oppression and not be overwhelmed by them that we find serenity in the presence of God, that we free ourselves from the obligation to do everything and be everything to everyone and acknowledge that God is at work, that God's got us. And so this week, I'm gonna ask something of you. Every day, I want you to acknowledge that you are a child of God. I want you to look at your neighbors, strangers, fellow church members, everyone, and acknowledge to yourself, this person is a child of God. And we don't find unity in doctrine. We don't necessarily find unity in what we know or what we believe in our theology. But we can find unity and witness to a new creation through love in Christ. And even though we disagree with each other, sometimes on vital, fundamental things, we can still find a way to love each other. We can still find a way to free ourselves of the thought that we must do everything. We find the freedom to walk away from people and systems of abuse and take the time to heal and find the joy and rejuvenation and restoration that comes through God's grace. Let us, through God's love, this week, proclaim the unity that this divided world truly needs. And in our actions, our thoughts, and in our beings, be a witness to God's grace that all may find the peace of Christ and in us a friend. Amen.